Good morning, and welcome to worship at Zion Community Church of the Nazarene. We are so glad that you have joined us online this morning. And please be sure to check out our website at zioncommunity.org and find some links to previous sermons, our online bulletin, and uh, to continue to support the mission of our church through the giving of your tithes and offerings. We sincerely hope that you have had a special Christmas celebration this past week and that the presence of God was with you in the midst of this continued celebration season of unknown and and change during the continued COVID-19 pandemic situation. The Christmas tree lights are dimmed. The the once wrapped gifts, they've been shared, but the awesome love of God still shines brightly in our hearts. Our spirits resound with the good news of salvation. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord of mercy and joy, you have given to us the blessings of your son, Jesus, who will make known your presence, forgiveness, and love to each of one of us. Be with us this day and keep our hearts and minds open to receive your love and peace. Enable each of us to be people of joy and hope as we encounter others and as we enter into this new year before us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I I want to begin our final message of 2020 uh, with a true story. Uh, During the summer of 1904, an unlikely partnership was formed at the World's Fair in in St. Louis. The summer was unusually hot, and and people were searching all around the fair for for something to help cool them off. And Arnold Fornishow had exactly what they were looking for, ice cream. People lined up for what seemed like miles to get some of his cool and satisfying treat, but he had just one problem. Arnold was not prepared for this level of demand, and and he ran out of his paper bowls. He, He was forced to wash a few porcelain bowls over and over again, and this resulted in too few bowls and people getting tired of waiting. Uh, Next to Arnold's ice cream booth was the booth of a pastry chef named Arnest Hamwi, and he was was making a Persian wafer dessert called Zalabia. Ernest also had a problem. His pastry was not selling. He noticed the problem that that Arnold was having, and, and he took some of this warm pastry and he rolled it into a cone shape. He, he then went over and showed Arnold how this pastry could help hold a, a, a scoop of the ice cream. And on this fateful hot day in the 1904 World's Fair, the ice cream cone was born. All because a partnership was formed. Talk about a partnership for a purpose. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty grateful to Arnold and Ernest partnering together for something greater than they could ever do on their own. While this is true for the the brilliance of the ice cream cone, uh, it's even more true with what God calls us to do as well. What amazes me about, about God's plan for salvation is that he wants to partner with you and with me. He's provided the, the sweet forgiveness and eternal hope like the ice cream, but even better. And he, he puts it in a cone like me and like you. Have you ever noticed that last cone in the box? The, the top is usually broken and the bottom has been mashed out. Uh, maybe that's you and, and maybe that's me. Most would just throw that cone away but not our God. He fills it with the good news, and and that's the answer for something a whole lot more important than being too hot on a summer day. No wonder then the Apostle Paul uses a pretty similar illustration when he shares in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 through 7. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The message paraphrase shares this same passage in this way, and I hope you hear it fresh this morning. Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, 
light up the darkness and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not too much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't been broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder— What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. No one buys the ice cream cone for the cone, or at least not many of us. No one finds a treasure and says, what an amazing box, and and keeps the treasure chest, but throws the gold away. Doesn't it amaze you that God would choose to put his priceless treasure, the good news of Jesus Christ, in clay jars like me and like you? It's a partnership that only happens because of his grace and his mercy. It's a partnership the Apostle Paul found joy in as he remembered sharing his ministry with Timothy and the leadership and and all of God's people in the church in Philippi. This morning, let's open the word of the Lord together from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I thank my God every time I remember you. In my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this word to us this morning. Thank you for who you are and how you desire to partner with us in the gospel. Thank you for how you've used and blessed this church, Zion Community Church of the Nazarene, in the past. What you continue to to do today, even in the midst of an ongoing global pandemic, as well as what you desire to do in the future. Help us to remember your promises, Lord, to to rely on your faithfulness and, and to pursue you passionately, both individually and as a church family. May we live in this truth in this new year and in the days ahead and trust to bring this good work of gospel, of the gospel to completion. Amen. This morning, on on the last Sunday of this unique year that we'll always remember in 2020, and now leading into the first day of 2021 later this week, I am so thankful to share this message with you this morning, focusing on the main theme, on a main, main theme of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. As we close out this year and begin anew, I I challenge you to take some time to pause and and to reflect uh, on our most important callings, commitments, and opportunities that God has blessed us with. And one of the most important callings, commitments, and opportunities that I can absolutely imagine um, is our call to partner with Christ that Paul speaks of in this morning's passage. We are, in fact, uh, as individual Christians and, and as followers of Christ, we are partners in the gospel ministry. As congregations and as individuals, we should strive to to work together, to labor together, to sow together, and to reap a harvest together. We are in this mission together. This message from Philippians chapter 1, it is meant to edify, to strengthen, to encourage, and and to help us as we do the work of the gospel. It's a a great and a glorious work that our, our Lord has given us to do in partnership with him. We find in these verses that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in the city of Philippi from his jail cell in Rome. 
He and a young preacher by the name of Timothy, they were working together. It, it, became, uh, it becomes evident right away that, that Paul loved this church dearly. It, it was a strong congregation doing a great work of the Lord. And, and this church stands in pretty sharp contrast to some of the other churches that we see in, in Galatians and, and Corinthians and, and, and Galatia and Corinth, which were struggling with some serious issues of doctrine and morality, uh, dissension and infighting within the church. Paul loved these churches as well, uh, but, but they had more than their share of some serious problems. And the Philippian church seems to be stable and had apparently overcome these issues, uh, for Paul did not see the need uh, to address them. Uh, there's a positive tone in this book uh, that he gives the saints, the bishops, the deacons, and, and Paul sends a greeting to them all. In verse 3, it, it is with joy that he remembers this church. In verse 5, Paul thanks God that they considered themselves to be partners in the gospel. In verse 6, Paul expresses a confidence that the work God has given them to do will get done, that, that it'll be completed. Paul takes the time to remind this church that we ought to strive to finish what God has begun in us. Be faithful. Work hard. Don't stop. Keep serving. When will the work be completed, you might ask? When we see Jesus Christ face to face. Until then, we worship, we work, we witness, and we labor. We do the ministry that God has called us to do. And, and how do we complete the work? What, what enables us to hang in there over the long haul? Verse 2 tells us grace, the grace of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, we'll be able to do the work that God has given us to do. Grace it sustains us when we feel we can't go on. Paul also mentions in verse 3, thanksgiving. Let us be thankful uh, for the opportunities that God gives us to serve him. In verse 4, he mentions prayer. We cannot complete the work of the Lord has, that is given us to do unless God's people pray. In verses 7 and 8, Paul makes it clear that he has loved this church. He has cared for them, and he cares for their spiritual well-being. He, he loved them deeply with a pastor's heart. He, he had shared in their burdens and in their victories. When, when we share life together ourselves, it strengthens the bonds that exist between each of us. The church in Philippi was on his mind and, and in his heart as he went about doing the work of the Lord where, wherever he sent him. The work of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and this is our work and our calling too. To confirm to a lost world the truth of the gospel, that, that Jesus Christ is the solid rock for us to cling to during the storms of life and in the good times. We are called to, to cling to him, to serve him, to worship him, and to love him. We help and we serve one another uh, regardless of our circumstances and regardless of an ongoing pandemic and, and through months of online worship services and, and canceled event after canceled event. This passage from Philippians uh, chapter 1, it, it shares a, a powerful lesson for each of us that we serve the Lord in all circumstances. Why? Because we truly are in this together. For Paul, he would serve God period. It didn't matter whether he was in chains defending the gospel or confirming the gospel. God's grace and peace allowed him to serve the Lord no matter what, regardless of our own circumstances. As followers of Christ, we are all partakers of God's grace and we are partners in this mission. We all share in the grace of God that helps us through the difficult times and we will face as we serve him. As we have read this morning, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, includes this powerful phrase that I've tried to emphasize, because of your partnership in the gospel. Let's, let's take a moment to look closer at what a partnership is really means. And there are two categories of relationship needs that, that help us uh, better understand what a, a partnership requires. The first one is personal needs. Um, 
The second one is organizational needs. So personal needs, these are relational, social, and emotional attributes. Uh, organizational needs, these would be tasks and structures and work responsibilities that we might share. If you have both low personal needs and low organizational needs, then you would be considered an outsider. Y you don't have a shared relationship and you don't have a shared purpose or goal. But if you have low personal needs and high organizational needs, then, then you would be considered maybe a vendor. Uh, you have no shared relationship, but you do have a shared purpose or goal. If you have high personal needs and low organizational needs, then you would be considered a friend. You do have a shared relationship, but you don't necessarily have a shared purpose and goal. But if you have both high personal needs and a high organizational needs, then you're considered a partner. You have a shared relationship and a shared purpose and goal. When you're in a partnership built on both these, these high personal and organizational needs, the relationship is something to be treasured, something to be committed to and worked at. Partnerships, they require accountability and intentionality. When you're dealing with a partner, you work together in a special relationship with a specific goal in mind. And in our partnership with Christ, we are in a partnership for the gospel, a partnership for making disciples, a, a partnership for spiritual growth, and a partnership with the kingdom of God. Each of us is called to be an important part of a, a true partnership with a God-sized purpose. In, in Philippians 1, Paul not only remembers the Philippians, he gives thanks and he prays for them because they have been his partners in the work of the Lord. When God calls them his partners, he uses a Greek word, koinonia. And this word appears in the New Testament 19 different times for a range of different meanings, all centered around fellowship, joining together, and partnership. And the sense is always of a shared relationship, a two-sided partnership. Uh, to help you picture this, let's imagine we have a man named John and a woman named Joan, and they meet. John falls in love with Joan, but Joan's heart is unmoved towards John. Uh, this is not koinonia. This is a one-sided relationship. But if Joan returns John's love, if it's mutual, now we have koinonia. Both are giving themselves to the other. The Philippians mean so much to Paul because they have been partners with him in the work of God. They were joined in Christ and they went through sufferings together. They went through celebrations together and they have shared together in the spreading of the gospel. Throughout the Gospels, we, we find some awesome accounts of Jesus first gathering his team, his disciples who would follow and learn from him for his three years of ministry, and those years have changed the course of history. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, and we know these famous words as part of the Great Commission. They're Jesus' final challenge and instructions before ascending back into heaven. And if we're truly to be more than just a social gathering, we must remember that, that God actually expects us to live this out today. Jesus' disciples and his followers are, are meant to be disciple makers. And when we talk about a disciple, it's important to remember that the goal is simply not gaining more information about what we say or do. Being a disciple of Jesus is about transformation. Our lives are to, to never be the same again. And, and true discipleship, it happens through, through learning together, growing together, praying together, and serving together. We gather and worship online or in person, intentionally connecting to God through sharing in praise and prayer, word and table. We gather together in community. When we gather together, we are entrusting the, the deepest parts of our, our lives to each other, sharing our, our joys and our sorrows, our strengths and our weaknesses. We gather together for spiritual formation, to intentionally learn to grow and to become more like Christ. A common question we ask kids all the way up to high school seniors and beyond is, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I know this question is not ill-intended, and you may have asked it or heard it at your family gatherings. What vocation or job we have or pursue may not be the most important question for us to ask as disciples of the kingdom of God first and foremost. Life is not just about what we do, but rather about who we are, who we're becoming, and whose we are. 
I personally struggled with this question of purpose and calling and vocation even several years out of college. And narrowing down to just one major was so hard that I tried to fit in multiple majors and minors through my time at Olivet. And eventually I crammed in about 160 credit hours in four years. And if you do a quick bit of math, that is 20 credit hours a semester. And I ended up with a major in education. Um, but I still knew that God had more for me and called the ministry. And so then I pursued a, a master's in Christian formation and discipleship through the Nazarene Seminary. And just this past semester, I finished up a graduate certificate in church administration. And along the way, I have just been so thankful for the opportunity to, to learn and to grow as a person and a pastor, but even more so as a follower of Christ and l- learning more about how God has called uh, me and to use my gifts and strengths where he has placed me. We all have gifts. We all have spiritual gifts, and we all have God-given strengths. And as a partner with Christ in his mission, we have the responsibility and the opportunity to find joy, to find satisfaction and growth in the ways that that we are called to serve him, um, to serve God, our church, and other people. God has placed within each of us a calling to serve others and to advance the cause of Christ and his church. Your calling is what God wants to do in your life and our talents and our strengths, they, they determine how you'll get that part done. And it's through the Holy Spirit, God does give each of us uh, a spiritual gift by God's grace alone. And it's for the purpose of the entire body of Christ. It's from God to every believer. And it's not for ourselves, but for the whole body. And as a partner with Christ in his mission, it's so important for us to understand that last part. This is not for us, but for the whole body and for the glory of God. We exist for God and for neighbor. As partners in this two-sided, purpose-filled relationship on the brink of a brand new year that's full of hopes and plans and and some concerns, I want to challenge each of us to take a moment for a quick self-assessment, a reflection that that helps us see where we came from, to see where we are, and, and to set some goals for where we want and need to be as we're partnering together with God's mission. With these goals in mind, there are four questions that I want to share today to guide in this partnership renewal. First, where do you want to be a year from now spiritually? Second, what is your plan for reaching that goal? Third, what is the next step that you need to take in your spiritual growth? And lastly, how can you start using your gift to serve the body of Christ. This is important for us to do both individually in our our own personal walk with God and corporately as a church leadership team. This unique year of 2020 has been full of distractions and increased opportunities to neglect using our gifts and gathering together in worship and being united in purpose. But that does not mean our mission has changed. Our participation as partners in the gospel is needed more than ever before. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi while sitting in a Roman prison awaiting his trial. While he might have been forgiven had he chosen to take a bit of time off as a sabbatical or break, he instead used even that situation as an opportunity to advance the gospel. Paul understood the power of staying on mission, even in prison. He, he never lost his passion, his, his sense of mission, his sense of direction, or an opportunity to remind others of our shared purpose as partners of the kingdom. Paul knew that a purpose will motivate you. A purpose will will keep your priorities straight. A purpose will develop your potential. It will give you power to live in the present and help you evaluate progress. We exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ through loving God and loving others. And this is a mission that is worth pursuing and it requires each of us to join in partnership with Christ, with what he's already done, with what he's currently doing, and yes, what he will do in the future. Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He continues on in verses um, 9 through 11, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best 
and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is my prayer for each of us scattered in our homes today on this final Sunday of of 2020, that we will live each day intentionally partnering with Christ, partnering with his mission and his kingdom. Our partnership with Christ, it calls us to remember God's faithfulness, and to be confident in his sustaining grace, to to step out into action as the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. We are partners in the gospel, called to live in the way of Jesus, doing the ministry and work that God has given us to do. May it be so. Please receive this morning's benediction. We have been given the great light which has come into the world. This light of peace and hope, joy and love, shines on us, in us, and through us to all those we meet. Go now in peace and let the light of God's love go with you as we partner with his mission in the world today and into this new year. Amen.